Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University. You can find this episode wherever you listen to podcasts. In this and future podcasts, I sit down with leaders who are shaping the future of higher education in America and beyond. We dive into the challenges and opportunities facing higher education and explore policies and practices that show promise of a brighter future. Hope that you will find these conversations stimulating and thought-provoking, and if you do, please subscribe so that you will not miss future episodes. Again, I'm your host, Georgia State President Mark Becker, and today my guest is Dr. DuBose Bowman, Dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. DuBose, welcome back to Ann Arbor. Thank you. Well, you know, you know Atlanta well, um, you know Ann Arbor well, um, and we first met more than 20 years ago in Ann Arbor, but please share with our listeners, because we're really going to talk about faculty career development and opportunities for students, particularly students of color, um, a little bit about your career development uh, back and forth between Ann Arbor, Atlanta, New York, sure. Chapel Hill. Sure. Yeah, so my educational journey began uh, just in the neighborhood uh, of where we're located now. Uh, I was an undergraduate student at Morehouse College. Right and attended Morehouse with an interest in mathematics, but was looking for areas of application that I might I may pursue following uh, my, my undergraduate days and, and also even considering pure mathematics as, sure. as a possible pathway. And ultimately, uh, through a mentor, uh, Dr. Bill Jenkins locally, who was here in Atlanta at the time at the Centers for Disease Control, learned about the field of biostatistics and epidemiology and eventually public health. And so that ended up prompting me to pursue graduate school uh, in, in biostatistics. And I attended the University of Michigan and completed a master's degree there and had, a, had an illustrious uh, categorical data analysis <laughs> professor, uh, Dr. Mark Becker. Uh, and, and so I'm very well trained in categorical data analysis and, and then eventually went on to pursue my, my doctorate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Com- after completing my doctorate, I uh, pursued faculty positions and uh, landed here also again in Atlanta at, at neighboring Emory University and spent about 14 years at Emory and later was recruited to uh, Columbia University in, in New York City and went there as, de- as department chair uh, for biostatistics for a period of about five years. So if I understand it correctly, your father is also an academic? That's right. That's so, right. so you knew something of the academic life. Did that make a difference when you were a student at Morehouse thinking about what do I do after I get my bachelor's degree in mathematics? I think so. The, you know, my, my upbringing did not involve a high degree of, uh, of steering, of parental mm-hmm. steering, but just having in the background uh, knowledge of academia, having known about people who were colleagues of, of my father and knowing that that was out there, uh, I think uh, perhaps piqued my interest in, in research. And then importantly, as an undergraduate student, was fortunate to get into some undergraduate research programs that allowed me to get a taste of, of, of research and, and ultimately uh, you know, piqued my interest in, mm-hmm. in pursuing uh, higher education. Now, as I remember your time at the University of Michigan, and I remember it well because I think you were the first and one of only two African-American students to come through our program in the ten and a half years I was there. Uh, so I know from your personal experience starting as a graduate student, you really have had a commitment to diversity and inclusion. So could you sort of take us through your career about how that commitment uh, evolves, grows, develops as you go from graduate student to professor to department chair and today dean? Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember those days very well as a graduate student and you know, I, I attended University of Michigan after attending Morehouse College right. and uh, graduating at Morehouse with a class of really talented mathematics majors. Mm-hmm. And so for me, even as a graduate student, uh, perhaps recognizing that there was work to do in, in terms of pipeline, but that right. there were there was talent there, there were people there, and so you went uh, to school with them at Morehouse. I, w- I went to school with them <laughs> yep. and, and learned a lot from them. They you know and they challenged me in my thinking and allowed me to grow during mm-hmm. during that time. And so uh, so so I I was driven even as a graduate student to begin to to take some steps to try to think about efforts that, that, that we could pursue to diversify the field mm-hmm. of biostatistics. And that, that has been very rewarding I, I, during the early days as a senior graduate student working together with faculty, 
uh, partnering to establish a, a group with one, within one of our professional societies and hosting annual workshops over a period of now of 20 years uh, that, that, that now, 20-plus uh, years later, really seeing the landscape change just in terms of the exposure, uh, the number of um, underrepresented minorities who go into the field of biostatistics, who successfully are able to matriculate uh, through graduate school and land into the profession, and now many are actually at leadership stages in their careers. I'm sure you've been a role model for many over these last 20 years. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to think so. And, and uh, along with that, though, peers who I look up to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think it's a sort of a mutually beneficial exchange that, mm -hmm. that we all draw uh, sort of positively from, from that network. So, and then, you know, carrying, carrying forward to being a faculty member, uh, even as a junior faculty member where I wasn't necessarily in a, uh, a leadership position within right. the department, but began working and mentoring uh, undergraduate students at that time, initially during summer months and then over the course of, of the academic year and, and continuing sort of local efforts uh, like that. And then in my move to go to Columbia University mm -hmm. as department chair, felt that I was in a uh, a better position to sort of lead on behalf of, right. of a department. And at Columbia, uh, I, my department led a summer pipeline program. I was also the co-PI of another school-wide program focused on doctoral uh, students across the disciplines represented within public health. So still, you know, very much uh, involved and embedded in trying to provide uh, any experience that I'd gained to students in training to make the path pathway a bit easier and allow them to uh, to matriculate uh, without some of the some of the barriers or, or, or with more information that, that that I had. Well, what's exciting about your journey and your, your your leadership that you're providing today now that you're a dean is, you know, the question often gets asked is, does where does change come from? Does change come from the bottom up? Does change come from the top down? And so you're really uh, going to get the experience in, in this particular area, diversity, inclusion, encouraging African Americans to go into our field of biostatistics. But now you've got a larger ballywick of public health. But, you know, you started off bottom up. Yeah. You know, the program you talked about was started by some professors, um, you know, some of them uh, we both know well. Um, and, you know, they started that program and you and others engaged you know, as a student first and then as a faculty member later. So literally faculty members just saying, this is the right thing to do. We're going to do it, and you That's organize right. it at a, you know at a, a really a national level for the field of biostatistics. That's right. Um, and started with some funding from the NIH, if I remember correctly. That's right. And so that was bottom up, and now your dean is top down. As as you've made your transition, you as you say, we went to Columbia. It's you were in a different position now. Uh, how do you support so that the bottom up continues at the same time that now you're, you know, in the administration, in the leadership, also wanting to lead, you know, you get to lead from the front now, yeah. uh, but still empowering faculty to, you know, come up with new ideas and, you know, put their hands up and say, we, we can do this, write grant proposals, get funding sources, organize colloquiums, conventions, meetings, conferences, whatever's the case. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to start just by reinforcing the, the importance of the point that you made along the way, and, and that is the, the, sort of the critical role of having commitment from the very top, mm -hmm. but also the ground level support and commitment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the most successful initiatives, activities, long-term progress will only arise when you, when you have both of those in sync. And when I'm talking to, to various uh, faculty or possibly even students about about leadership, one of the things that I will comment uh, on is to, to encourage people to lead from where you are. Mm -hmm. And as I reflect back now on some of those activities that we just discussed, I, at the time I didn't really view them as leadership, mm -hmm. right? But they were things that I was in a position to offer that perhaps a leader may not have been able to, to, to offer in that right. same way. And that was sort of the ground up level. And so now I find myself in that leadership capacity, able to think strategically across a school, able to provide perhaps some resources, but that by itself, it's necessary but not sufficient. Right. And, and that it, it, there's a critical role for that ground level commitment of faculty, staff, perhaps other students to, to, for ultimate success. But then one of the challenges, I mean, you've worked at all tier one research universities, you know, outstanding institutions, is 
uh, the expectations on the faculty are um, demanding. Yep. Uh, you know, tenure and promotion is uh, far from trivial. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a high bar to cross, and first off, congratulations for crossing it. Uh, Absolutely. But, but, you know, that's uh, for all of us, that's, that's the big hurdle for a lot of faculty. But uh, particularly minority faculty and female faculty seem to uh, get, if you will, overburdened with yeah. a request to, to mentor and to take on these activities. You know, first, did you experience that? And second, how did you balance, you know, um, that commitment to the greater good and making sure that others ha have opportunities like you've had and, and maybe even better opportunities at the same time that you're becoming a star professor and ultimately a department chair and a dean? Yeah. It's always an incredibly tough balance to strike. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately I would, I would encourage people who anywhere along the, that trajectory that you try to identify what you're most passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to, whether that's a line of research inquiry, whether that's you know, leadership, a certain type of service activity, that you try to identify things that you're passionate about. And you, and you have to think about those within the context of career advancement and promotion, but, but to not necessarily uh, be completely constrained or limited by by, by career promotion right. and and so the, the the challenges at each stage as you as you find your passion uh, you find things that you want to uh, ways that you want to try to contribute and make a difference uh, but also staying true to whatever those hurdles are that you have to, to, to right. Uh, achieve just in your your own uh, career development, and and it's not it's not a, a simple solution. It's not a one size fits all. I have had the benefit of having mentors along the way. Sometimes just for those decision points of, you know, this opportunity has presented itself. It seems like something that I want to do, you know, but it comes in context of several other commitments. Can you help me think through how beneficial this would be? Uh, and, and, and to just really do your best at each, at each stage making those decisions. So mentoring is a piece that we talk a lot about in higher ed, and we talk about the importance of mentoring junior faculty. Were you proactive in seeking mentors, or did mentors reach out to you? How, how do you remember your journey, particularly in those assistant professor years? Yeah. I was fairly proactive about seeking out mentors, but also extremely grateful that there were people who were receptive mm -hmm. you know I could tell that there were people who wanted to play that role for me and so these were often mentors in an unofficial capacity sure. yeah. not necessarily a sign but um, you know perhaps they saw something in me that made them want to contribute mm -hmm. and and for me it, it provided a, a, a tremendous resource that plays out really over the, the course of one's career. Yep. And even at a late stage of, of my career now, I'm often in contact with some of those same people and, and have built uh, strong relationships where we're able to just have frank and candid conversations yep. and, and to sort through issues. And so that, that has been a tremendous asset for me and continues to be throughout my career. Now, now that you're dean, how do you think about mentoring the junior junior faculty in the Michigan School of Public Health? Sure. So it, there's no greater resource in a school, in a university, than junior faculty, right? They become the future as students who, who are in training become future leaders. And, and so it, it's a it's a clear responsibility to really nurture the careers of junior faculty. Mm -hmm. And we're putting structures in place at the University of Michigan to, to build already on, uh, I think, a place of strength in that regard, just to make sure that we're doing everything that we can do. Uh, personally, I, um, I, I view myself as you know, open for providing guidance and mentoring for anyone who wants it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, you don't need to sleep. <laughs> sleeping, sleeping is important in recharging, uh, but 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 just in terms of my openness to provide, you know, and it may be it may not necessarily be a continuous mentoring relationship, but you know, a decision point uh, as, as phone people call, a phone call, conversation at a meeting or a conference. That's right, and and from my own experience, you know, I have a, a, a set of mentors. They probably underappreciate the value that they provided to me at those moments, right, that I, I will continue to be grateful for o over the years. So, and, and uh, my mentoring actually extends outside of the University of Michigan, a, a, a group of 
of junior faculty across the country who I've established relationships over the years, some informal mentoring capacities through grants, others more informally who I continue to stay in touch with. And, and it's very rewarding to me to be able to see their successes at various stages. Well, it's, you know, and the technical assistance like success in writing grants and, you know, and how to get published and where to send certain articles, you know, important stuff. Absolutely. But I also think back, like you, I didn't have formal mentors. I had informal mentors, people that I saw it out or happened somehow our paths crossed. And what I remember from my own experience was just the importance that actually these people believed in me. Yeah. You know, that, you know, for first generation student in my case is um, I had no, you know, personal role models other than the professors I'd had, but that other people in the field. Um, and by the time, you know, like you, I get outside of my field and I'm now, let's say, in a dean's office and assistant associate dean, people in, even in other disciplines, literally just the power of, you know, believing in you is, is so important. And I think uh, it's important and for all of our faculty to understand that uh, think the ways they can impact lives just by supporting and encouraging students and believing in them yeah, is so yeah. powerful. Absolutely. It's, it, it's been something that has been personally very important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, people who, through that belief, challenge me to dig deeper in myself and not that I really viewed myself as someone who didn't always try to uh, reach a high standard or right. didn't always try to be ambitious, but there's something about someone else seeing talent in you, believing in you, having high expectations that, that really uh, keeps you true to, to, to those efforts and, and allows you to, to dig deeper. So I, I completely and wholeheartedly agree uh, with, your, with your remark that it, it's important for all of us as faculty to be able to realize that power mm -hmm. that we have and, and, and to leverage it uh, to, the, to the benefit of, of people who are training. Some set, somehow it's free, but it's not given away lightly. That's right. That's right. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, just as you said, the University of Michigan developing programs, trying to really be best in class and lead. And that's the same thing we're trying to do here at Georgia State. We've recently announced our initiative to basically literally try to change the faculty of the next generation by uh, supporting the faculty that we do hire, being very intentional about how we hire, um, dealing with issues like implicit bias, uh, but also priming the pipeline so that the pipeline for the next generation looks much more diverse than what you and I have experienced over the course of our career. So Absolutely. I certainly um, look forward to over the years of staying connected, uh, staying in conversation really over the weeks and months about yeah. what you're doing, what you're thinking about up in Ann Arbor um, and all of my former colleagues up there and what we're thinking and working on here. And hopefully we can work together. So yeah. I think we've got a, a, we share a mission and a vision and um, we just need to stick to the work. So Absolutely. Thank, you know, and, what, and what you've done here at, at Georgia State is, is remarkable. And, and really unprecedented. And, and I think it creates an opportunity to not, not only for you here at Georgia State, but as a model for others to follow. Mm -hmm. And then a network of partnering institutions to really try to, to take that next step. And so I uh, would love to, to continue you know, to think together and, and, and to partner uh, toward that goal. That's terrific. It's, it's, it's amazing to think back now that I'm old enough that people I once had in class are now deans. So Indeed. Congratulations. <laughs> Glad to have you in Atlanta again. Yep. Um, hope you'll visit often and look forward to visiting you in Ann Arbor. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, this has been Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University. And you've been listening to a conversation with Dean DuBose Bowman, Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. To hear future conversations with leaders who are helping to shape the future of higher education, you will find conversations with Mark Becker anywhere that you can get podcasts. Thank you for listening, and remember to subscribe so that you will not miss future episodes. Goodbye for now.